Thank you, Dan McKenzie. Dan is such a good sport, isn't he? Well, I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm overwhelmed and humbled. I, I don't consider myself a pastor yet, just a pastor in training. Every time I get the opportunity to um, tell someone what I do for a living now, I can't help but well up with pride in a good way. Um, and tell people our story as a congregation about the grace and um, just unmitigated joy uh, and generosity that you guys furnished me with. Uh, um, um, one second. You all furnished me with a scholarship to seminary and that that's uh, and a job and. I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude. Well, the last several times I've had the opportunity to preach, I have been led to focus on the theme of perseverance in suffering. Perhaps that's because I've been in McKenzie's boot camp, suffering from the delayed onset of muscle soreness. More likely, however, it's because the Holy Spirit knows that what we're going through, well, I call that providence. Because I don't believe in coincidence or chance. Today, I want to talk about the end result of perseverance in suffering. And the end result of perseverance is resurrection. There is perhaps no better example in all of Scripture, other than Easter morning, to learn about the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus raising Lazarus from the tomb is without a doubt the greatest of all Jesus' miracles. And, and if you're thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Lazarus is just one guy. Didn't he heal scores of people at a time? Didn't he feed the 5,000? Hadn't he even resurrected people before? Yes, but you see, none of those miracles cost Jesus anything. This miracle will set into motion the events that will cost Jesus his life. This is a fact that none of the players in today's lesson could have possibly known except for Jesus. I want us to hang on to that idea of needing perspective as we turn to today's lesson. You see, this story isn't a parable. It really happened. There is no philosophical allegory happening here. This isn't the book of Job. We tend to read John chapter 11, 11 knowing how it ends and think, oh, how cool. What a neat thing Jesus did for his friends. But that isn't at all how Mary, Martha, and certainly not Lazarus would have felt about it. To them, this was real raw, gut-wrenching pain. So this morning, I'm going to ask that we set aside our lenses of perspective and enter the first century village of Bethany and try to identify with Mary and Martha, who don't yet know how the story is going to end. Many of us in this room have been through the pain of loss recently and know what it's like firsthand. To you, my dear friends, let me just say that my heart breaks for you. I love you. This congregation loves you. Jesus loves you. And I pray that the peace of the gospel washes over you this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit and gives you strength to find his glory even here. The here in this passage is a town called Bethany. It's a village just a couple miles east of Jerusalem. And it's in this story, the week before Passover. This town is located on the road to Jericho, where 
Scores of pilgrims traveled down the Jordan River Valley annually for the festival. In the previous chapter of John, Jesus makes a claim about his divinity, and the Jews sought to stone him, but he escaped their grasp. He fled back over the Jordan to let things calm down a bit, and it's here where he and the disciples received word that their dear friend Lazarus was sick. Jesus corrects the report and flatly tells them that he has already died, but that he wants to go to him anyway. Fearing that they may be stoned if they show back up, Thomas boldly states that he wants to go back to Bethany with Jesus so that they might die with him. It is in this context that we find our lesson this morning. Turn with me now to John chapter 11, verses 17 through 44. Listen now to the word of the Lord. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined in the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when he had said these things... She went on her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard it, she arose and quickly came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Mary and Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, I do not say to you that you would not believe you would see the glory of God. Then they looked and took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you have always heard me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And if I should say anything that is not of your will, may it fall to the ground and be quickly forgotten. But Lord, when you speak your truth to your people, may you write it in our hearts and change our lives forever. Amen. Just a few weeks ago, the crowds wanted to make him king, and now they want to stone him to death. And after this miracle, in just a few days' time, they will shout Hosanna in the highest as he comes riding into Jerusalem on a colt. Is that just like us? Throughout all of recorded history, people never seem to change. We're so fickle. We can't make up our minds. So what changed when this miracle occurs? Why did the crowd go from wanting to stone him on one hand to, want, to wanting to crown him king again on the other? Well, we have to understand the context of what is happening here. Remember a few weeks ago when we learned about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and, and we talked about the crowds wanting to seize him by force and make him king. And he was all like, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I didn't come to be that kind of king. So they said, okay, get lost then. Well, the same people that he fed from the region of Galilee have traveled south to the region of Bethany, and they are camped out waiting for the Passover festival in Jerusalem. It's only two miles away. They've seen Jesus preaching and have kind of had it with him, talking about how he's the son of God. Because if that's true, and I believe down to the core of my being that it is, it changes everything. Jesus is saying, look, I don't want to just feed your bodies. I want to feed your souls. And they are basically asking, all right, but if there's no bread, then what's in it for me? You have to understand that this culture had no hope in death. There was no such thing as the resurrection. There was no known worldview that had that theology. Quite the opposite. Every other religion at that time focused on attaining the afterlife. No one had any context to explain what Jesus was talking about when he said he was going to be raised from the dead on the third day. So when Jesus performs this miracle, it forces them to come to terms with his divinity. Every other religion in the world back then and now says that religion is just a path to eternity or a path to enlightenment. Only Jesus is saying that I am life itself. Only Jesus is saying I am not a path to the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I want to be crystal clear on this point. I get the sense that most Christians struggle with the idea of who God is and who we are to him. We tend to think of Jesus as this disembodied spirit watching over us from a cloud up in heaven, but that isn't the case at all. Right now, at this very moment, Jesus literally has his flesh and bones. There are nail scars in his hands and his feet and a spear wound in his side. Likewise, he was eternally begotten of the Father, not made. He existed eternally before the foundation of the world was set. Jesus was there. Now we, by contrast, are creatures from the dirt who almost immediately from our existence defied the almighty everlasting God with sin, who promised us that if we did sin, we would surely die. So let's review. Jesus is not a path to life. He is life itself. He is the eternal, 
almighty, everlasting God. And we are depraved wretches from the dirt. Our default position is sin. And as Jonathan Edwards said, the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin which made it necessary. Now, why would I go and belabor that point before we get into the meat of this message? It's because just like the people of today's lesson, I want us to be confronted with the reality of Jesus' divinity. I think we look at this lesson as if it was legend, bedtime story, or a fairy tale. And we really never get into the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter here is that Jesus is concluding his public ministry. This is his last miracle in public, and it is certainly his most costly. Jesus is stepping into this grief, the stricken town. These people had no hope but to pray that the Messiah would come during their own lifetime. Scripture says that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days when Jesus shows up. The same messenger that had informed him that Lazarus was sick has run ahead and told Martha that he is now in town. You have to realize that death was a culturally communal deal in that society. When a person died during the day, in order to stay ceremonially clean, they were buried before sundown that same day. There was no time to send word to distant cousins and, and relatives and and prepare a thoughtful memorial service. Your funeral could be within the same hour that you died if it was getting close to sundown. Therefore, a time of memorial after the burial would last an entire week. It was a big production. Families would hire professional mourners to wail. They would put on ashes and sackcloths and and grieve. It is in this setting that we find Martha, Lazarus' sister. And she marches right out to confront Jesus. Now, this is not the first time she has done this. In Luke's gospel, when we meet Martha, she asks Jesus to tell Mary to help her with the housework. Hmm. She sounds a lot like my Rebecca. And the fact that she needs help with the housework all the time, not that she would literally tell the living incarnate God what to do, right? (laughs) If the shoe fits. I'm just kidding. But how often do we do the same thing? How often do we think that we know better than God? On a daily, if not hourly basis, right? Think not? Oh, I would think again. Every time we sin, it's like a little rebellion against God, where we say, I'm smarter than you. I know better. I don't trust you for my fulfillment. I don't like your timing. You know, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, you might say, (coughs) geez, Patrick, that... That sounds a little harsh. I mean, after all, Martha did just suffer a death in the family. And grief makes you do strange things. I completely agree, and I sympathize with her. But here's the thing. Martha's comment reveals a deep spiritual truth. She says, Lord, my brother would not have died. Now, what is that? That statement supposes that what we want for our lives and what God wants for our lives are the same thing. That statement questions his power. It doubts his ability. Up to that point, the power to resurrect the dead has been somewhat in question. In Luke 8, Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, who was said to have died, He also happened upon a funeral procession in the town of Nain, and a widow's son was being buried, and he had the young man right out of the casket. In both cases, it appears that the crowds thought that he simply 
resuscitated them. As it says in our chapter, in verse 37 of chapter 11, in our text today, mourners say, could he have not kept this man from dying? And that's what Martha is saying. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus responds, your brother will rise again. You know, Martha says, I know, but, but he will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. You know, Martha gets it. At least she's making a really good case that, she's, that she gets it. Her, her theology here is spot on. She's even got great eschatology. But what that shows us is that you can have all of your facts straight. You can have all of your ducks in a row. No scripture inside and out that still won't get you any closer to having peace with God. And if there was anyone who could, it'd be Martha. If she's family friends with Jesus, they are very close. You know, I'd like to think that if I had that kind of intimacy with Jesus, if he'd hung around my family, personally taught me the Bible, allowed me to witness hundreds of miracles that that I'd at least have the faith the size of a mustard seed in him. But I believe Martha's lesson is that we wouldn't. That we couldn't, even if we tried. At the end of the day, she is simply seeking equality with God. She wants to be in charge and call the shots. Now, don't we do the same thing? Paul writes in Philippians 2 that Christ took on flesh <clears throat> and even though he was fully God, did not think equality with God was something to be grasped, but rather he humbled himself. He humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. Don't you see how he's pleading with Martha? Martha, you've missed it. Yes, I could have healed Lazarus's body, but I didn't come here to do that. I came to heal his soul. And where would that leave you, Martha? What would you learn from that? How would you grow in your faith in me at all if, if I was just to solve your problems and then, well, leave you alone? He tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am not a means to an end. I don't just give life-saving healing. I am very literally the source of life itself. Nothing in the universe exists apart from me. Martha, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness, in the burning bush. I am that I am. And he who believes in me, even though may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now that's a question we all must answer. In your heart of hearts, do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. Martha makes an incredible, creedal confession of faith. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. And again, her theology is spot on. But as Matt Chandler points out, she's about to show an enormous lack of faith. He calls what she just said a spiritual platitude. You know, it's kind of like the bumper sticker faith. What she said is absolutely correct, but I think it was just something that she knew she was supposed to say at the time, but didn't really believe it. This is a dangerous place to dwell in your faith. It's a place where you just come to church and you go through the motions, but you're just stuck in neutral. You're not going anywhere. She's just made this amazing confession. Okay, Lord, I believe that you are the resurrection. You are the Christ, but... Jesus knows in her heart. He knows that in the depths of her grief, it's only lip service. 
Mary, her sister, repeats the same thing. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And I think in that moment, given the totality of the circumstances, it absolutely breaks Jesus' heart. It reads, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and all the Jews that were with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was deeply troubled. Deeply troubled doesn't remotely begin to do the Greek justice. The term is embre meomai. It means disturbed to his soul. The only other place this word is used is the night he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweats blood. Jesus can only muster. Where have you laid him? The next is the shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. Why does he weep? He, of all people, knows how this story is going to end. He knows that in just a moment, he's going to turn everyone's tears of sorrow into tears of joy. All of the wailing into singing praise. So why does he weep? Well, Tim Keller says, because he's perfect. The tears of Jesus Christ communicate that not for a second does he not care. Not for a moment will he refuse to enter into our suffering. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. We serve a God who weeps with us. Isn't that remarkable? John MacArthur describes how the Greek gods were thought to be numb or unfeeling towards humans, but not Jesus. He feels the loss of his friend. He feels the pain for himself and the pain of every human being throughout all of history. This past week, we heard news that one of Rebecca's former students passed away. She was only 27 years old and had struggled since the age of nine with an extremely rare degenerative neurological disorder that caused her to rapidly lose her eyesight and then suffer Alzheimer's-like symptoms until her death. Despite this, Rebecca Veck led one of the most joy-filled lives I may ever know. She never even let on that she had a disability. I believe that sort of strength can only come from the Holy Spirit. She trusted in him completely. I believe that standing in front of Lazarus' tomb, Jesus saw not only the sadness of Mary and Martha, but he looked long down the road of the hands of time and in deep emotion that embra meomai, the tears Jesus wept was because he saw Rebecca back too. He saw the Fredericks. He saw the Foxes. He saw all of us weeping and said to himself, it wasn't supposed to be this way. We cry out in anger and frustration because life isn't fair. A precious nine-year-old girl, aren't, they're not supposed to be diagnosed with such a terrible disease and, and go blind. We, are made, we were made to live in perfect peace with the Father in the garden. But our sin created this great chasm to be fixed between him and us. Don't you see that God is not the author of our suffering? We are. But despite this, in his matchless wisdom, God worked out a plan to bring us back home at infinite cost to himself. In this passage, we get a glimpse of Easter morning as Jesus muttered, Take away the stone. 
You know, Martha protests that Lazarus has been in there for four days. He stinks, Lord. I think Jesus saw right through her platitudes and responds, Did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? He took away the stone and he prayed, Father, I am grateful that you hear me, that you always hear me. But because of the people standing here, I pray this, that they would believe that you have sent me. After he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice. And again, the modern translation fails us. The Greek says that he cried out with a cry, mortal rage. He raged at the tomb, Lazarus, come out! And he who died came out and bound and head and foot with grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Jesus raged at the tomb because he was going into battle with death. Jesus knows that this miracle will set into motion the events that will end with him on the cross. He is very literally trading places with Lazarus. He knows that in order to get Lazarus out of that tomb, he's going to have to go in. In order for me to get out of my tomb, Jesus has to go in. In order for you to get out of your tomb, Christ had to go in. The lesson is simply this. In your walk with the Lord, do you simply pay lip service to the fact that he is the resurrection and the life? Or do you know that in your heart of hearts, you trust him completely the way Rebecca Beck did, the way Jim does, the way David and Lori do? Or do you constantly question his faithfulness and timing? Can you honestly say that there is nothing that you wouldn't sacrifice to see the glory of God? If so, then believe it and live as if the eternal were now because Jesus is. Know that he hates death. He hates tombs. He didn't spend very long in his tomb, and he doesn't want you to live your life as if you are already in yours. Remember, it's okay to cry, because he will meet you where you are. Jesus weeps too. In your heart of hearts, how will you answer the question when he asks, Do you believe this? Seek and you shall find. Martha said, the teacher is here, and he is asking for you. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we come before you this morning hurting and grieving for our broken world. We feel the sting of sadness and loss. For many of us, it is a new pain, but for some of us, it's an old wound, but we want to trust in you. We want to have the kind of faith that doesn't blink in the eye of the storm, but oh, you're so weak. We feel sorry for ourselves. We sometimes get the impression from the wisdom of the world that following after you should entitle us to comfort and a life free from pain. But Lord, you show us that is the furthest thing from the truth. Teach us that becoming a gospel-transformed Christian is a road not unlike yours, one full of sacrifice and humility, one full of loss and redemption. Humble us as we pray. We see so much hurting and we feel helpless to stop it. 
We see our neighbors struggling to make ends meet. We see strangers suffering from addiction. We see hopelessness and blithe, and we wring our hands of it. Give us courage to face these challenges. Give us resolve to be on the front lines for you. Strengthen us to be bold followers. To be the hands and feet that stand in the gap between the hungry and the fed. Between the hurt and the healer. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. We ask for your comforting mercies on all those dealing with the loss of a loved one. For all those struggling with illness. For uncertainty, for financial troubles, for all the worries that weigh us down that we feel are outside of our control. Grant us the perspective of your eyes and not our own. Free us from the prison of fear. We pray for our local and state officials, for our first responders. We pray for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, Lord, serving around the world. Keep them safe. We pray for our president and all those in the halls of Congress. May thy will be done. We pray for our pastor. Lord, we thank you that you sent us the men of hands. We lift them up. We pray for our church, for our congregation, and for our future home, Lord. We ask all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.